symposium. So I will, in this presentation, I will summarize a, a guideline that I published on uh, how to study animal cognition and decision making in the wild uh, using an observational approach. So it's um, it's meant mainly for scholars who want to have uh, more insight in evolutionary function of uh, cognitive abilities and the context in which they are used uh, in the wild by primates and also scholars who cannot do experiments because of ethical or conservation uh, reasons. For example, when you work with uh, highly endangered chimpanzees. So in the next 15 minutes, I will uh, discuss some of the steps that scholars can take that need a little bit more explanation. Uh, and I illustrate that with examples from my research with the chimpanzees. So, yeah, when you cannot do experiments, uh, you cannot uh, provide a stimulus, it's difficult to, to grasp the moment where individuals will really use cognition and employ it. So uh, the trick is to, to find a situation uh, in which they get the information somehow and, and then uh, measure, but decide on that uh, moment is not always easy. Um, so what you can do is you can think about evolutionary function uh, of the cognitive ability of interest, for example, planning, what are the challenges faced, can, how can a primate overcome these challenges, and then find situations in which they are likely motivated to employ their cognitive ability and then start your measurement. Now, one of the challenges that uh, primates, almost all primates, uh, especially chimpanzees, face is finding ripe fruit. It's a frequently changing uh, resource. Uh, fruiting trees get depleted, new seasons start, so primates need to continuously update themselves on where and uh, when uh, to go to find food. Um, we know from earlier studies from the 90s on Japanese macaques that uh, in other studies that primates use fruiting synchrony to discover fruit-bearing trees. Uh, so it is simultaneous emergence of fruits in many trees. So they use the discovery of fruit in one tree as an indicator for the presence of fruit in other trees of the same species. Um, but yeah, when you go into more detail in the ecological data and the fruiting histories of primate fruit trees, uh, you see that, and I discovered that during my PhD already and later during my postdoc, that there's quite some variation in synchrony levels. So the probability that if one tree bears fruit, that another tree within that same species also bears fruit very strongly between species. So some species have 80% of their trees full of fruits, so it makes sense to go and look, out, look for other trees, while other species have only 10%. So within this ecological situation, this context, I thought, yeah, uh, chimpanzees would really benefit from using intuitive statistics, a cognitive ability. They know which proportion of trees bear fruit in which species that would help them to increase their food finding success. So in short, uh, I studied chimpanzees in situations where they inspected trees at the start of several fruiting seasons to increase the, my chance of detecting their use of cognition. Now, another step uh, that uh, is useful to take is to think about alternative explanations. Obviously, a behavior can be expression of many different cognitive abilities. Uh, it can be that if the chimpanzee inspects a fruit tree that is using intuitive statistics, but it can also be that it's using sensory cues. So the trick is to then record variables in situations where you can exclude these alternative explanations. For example, by recording informative failing. So ask the question, what do chimpanzees fail to find? And I'll explain <laughs> why. So we recorded uh, inspections, uh, tree inspections for uh, in uh, continuous periods totaling 275 days. And here you'll see uh, some of these inspections. Let's see. This should work. It's no time, maybe. Yeah. So here we see a young male looking up in the direction of a tree crown. Uh, looking down on the ground, presumably checking for fallen fruits. Here we see an inspection of a male. He will look up to the right, 
in the direction of a tree crown, he looks up now and the little one behind him presumably follows his gaze and also has a good look what is up there and then we have a very clear example of an inspection where the whole group stops traveling sits down have a good look on what's in the tree uh the folk of follow a uh, female i followed she's uh, scratching herself excited or a bit nervous maybe <laughs> Maybe thinking if if there's fruit, will we all fit in that tiny tree? I don't know what she's thinking. But her son goes up, and in this case, the fruits are not ripe, and they continue traveling. And we were specifically interested in inspections of empty trees, trees that did not bear any fruit, and it could not cue the chimpanzees to look up. And so by recording when the chimpanzees would stop traveling, look in a direction at the crown and would fail to find fruits, we basically gained insight in, in their expectations. And by recording, observing uh, this behavior in the context, in this specific context, we could exclude uh, the possibility that she used sensory cues. So sort of controlling by observation. We recorded inspection probability, so the proportion of time the chimpanzees inspected the tree, an empty tree, the same day or the day after feeding on fruit of that same species. So if they feed on species A, do they or do they not then inspect at least one empty tree the day after or the same day. And then uh, we recorded synchrony levels uh, using uh, fruit availability data for 11 years in the chimpanzee territory. And this is a schematic example. And we calculated high synchrony levels when all the trees uh, within the species bear fruit at the same time. So one is fruit, zero is no fruit. And lower values were calculated when certain tree individuals like uh, the trees here, they uh, do not fruit within season or they fruit in other times of the year, like many figs do. And then we plotted the two against each other. Here the dots are the, the tree uh, species, so the figs have low levels of synchrony. And uh, we have here mean inspection probability after feeding on uh, uh, inspection of empty trees. Uh, we then ran a generalized linear mix model to control for uh, also fruit bearing tree density to make sure it was not the density of uh, fruit trees that triggered their inspections and we found that it's really the synchrony level of the fruit species so what proportion uh, yeah that that influenced uh, their inspection probability so these results the results from this study were consistent with the possibility that the chimpanzees used intuitive statistics they knew which species have high synchrony levels a high success rate of finding other fruit bearing trees irrespective of their density and the nice thing was that this study was confirmed its ability was confirmed with captive chimpanzees in experimental setting and the nice thing about the fieldwork is then that it gives additional insight in the, the evolutionary function of the ability. Now, another important step to take, I think, is to uh, not only record events, but also non-events. So in primatology, field primatology, especially observational studies, we have a tendency to only record what the animal does. So what trees it feeds in, which uh, animals, individuals eat grooms, but not so much which trees it doesn't feed in or which individual it doesn't groom. And yeah, as an experimental scientist, you may know the value of this, of recording when an animal does not react to a certain stimulus. So I asked the questions what chimpanzees do, but also what they do not do. And I did that in the context of, of this question. So after discovering these first fruits in the season, do chimpanzees inspect any tree of the same species or only specific trees of these highly synchronous species? And I asked that question because um, I knew again from ecological data that, there, that some trees produce more reliably than others. So here we see in green the months that the trees uh, bear ripe fruit. And if I was a chimpanzee, I would especially inspect this tree with ripe fruit 10 times in 11 years and not so much this tree, tree number eight. 
I also know that some species produce consistently more fruit than others. So here we see the percentage of ripe fruit months with more than 50% dry fruit cover. So meaning when the tree was full of fruits. And for example, in this particular fruit species, we find some individual is an outlier. He had th more than 30% of the months that there was fruit. He had a full crown. But there are also individuals, trees, that never have a full crown. So knowing this uh, ecological data, it, we, we can predict that it should pay uh, to differentiate between individual trees and not only inspect trees that are likely to bear large amounts and, and to only expect those that are likely to bear large amounts of fruit. So when did I do this? I investigated by looking at what trees do chimpanzees visit, but also which ones they do not visit. And so to do that, I sampled uh, the context. Uh, so I sampled for the availability of information prior to the start of observations. So I recorded events and non-events, which you call also a quasi-experiment. So we didn't manipulate anything, but we knew before what the information was and only then started recording. So we, we pre-sampled uh, the trees that were available. We did this by following a chimpanzee for 28 days. We could also have done it by uh, walking transects and sort of looking for trees. But here we were sure that the trees at least uh, contained edible fruits. The next uh, year, we followed the same female again, covering the same fruiting season. And we had again a number of trees. And then the third year, we recorded the ranging behavior towards these last year uh, feeding trees. So we had about 505 trees uh, that were visited in 2009, 2010. And then uh, 180 were approached. And out of these 180, 32 trees were fed in. And 148 were not, and presumably did not uh, bear uh, edible fruit. And then we looked at out of these 148 approaches, which trees were inspected and which ones were not, and were maybe passed by on the way to other food sources. And again, by running a GLMM, we were able to show that both the maximum amount of fruit in the previous years, so some trees were visited multiple times, that's why we took the maximum amount, and the number of feeding visits, so their familiarity with the tree, influenced inspection probability. So the more familiar they were with the tree, the higher the chance that they would inspect the tree if they would come within detection distance. Now from this, this study, uh, these results were consistent again with the possibility that wild chimpanzees use in a cross-seasonal memory or maybe you could call it even a year-long memory when they monitor fruit trees. And again, uh, this was supported by also work on captive chimpanzees uh, by an experimental approach. Now, lastly, I want to discuss uh, the step to, yeah, to try and record variables that allow for testing of conditional decision-making, interactive effects. Uh, so what do chimpanzees only do when certain conditions are met? And this I did in the context of a study on planning behavior. So once they have discovered this fruiting tree with lots of fruits in the beginning of the season, when do they return? Do they plan their return and, for example, depart earlier for certain fruits than for others? So these are the results of this study. Uh, here we look at nest departure times in sunrise. So zero is when the sun comes up and dark is when it's still dark. And then we have the distance from the nest, the sleeping site in the tree, to the breakfast site. And what we found was that chimpanzees depart earlier for, to breakfast on figs, which are here the yellow dots, but only when they're far away. So if they're close by, the yellow and the, the, the purple dots are fixed, and when they go further apart, they uh, separate. And some of these departures were also really in the dark. Now we knew that figs are eaten by more animal species than any other plant genus. When we returned to feeding tree, we found that the proportion of times sympatric animals are feeding in a tree 
think of monkeys, uh, squirrels, uh, birds, are much higher for fig trees than for other fruits. And so the results were best explained by the possibility that chimpanzees pla flexibly plan to depart earlier to reach fig breakfast sites in time to kind of compensate for travel time to beat the competition. Now you may wonder why is this line going up? So that's the model line that significantly predicts departure time for the other fruits. So the other fruits are uh, fruits like nuts or huge fruits that only chimpanzees can eat. So there's no competition. And for this, you also need to know that when breakfast is far away, they cannot reach it through the trees. So they have the nest in the trees and they can travel through the trees to reach nearby feeding sites. But when it's far, they have to go down to the forest ground. And there it can be dangerous. Leopards are very active in this area and especially early in the morning. So what we think happens is that when there is no real competition, uh, there was no need to leave earlier, they would simply wait until the forest was light and then leave. Now, this is an example of an interactive effect. So by, by measuring these variables like uh, yeah, distance, uh, type of food, and to test for their interactions, we can test also for conditional decision making. So what does a primate only do when certain conditions are met? So chimps only leave earlier, earlier for figs when they are far, further away. Now, I hope I've convinced you <laughs> that by identifying crucial context, controlling for interfering factors by including behavior observations of what animals fail to find, do not do or only do when, and by combining this with well thought out statistical models, and I didn't have a lot of time to explain them, but you can read about it, based on growing biological knowledge, we have decades now of uh, data on uh, primates uh, studies in the lab, in the field of their behavior, we are able to study decision making by observational approach. And then to briefly uh, link to the topic of this, uh, this uh, symposium, the comparative research, we of course would want to compare travel decisions across species and populations. So I'm very happy to show uh, this paper that just got out where we've discovered a wealth of data uh, on natural travel paths in many different primate populations collected by primatologists, which yeah, is uh, untapped potential for uh, comparisons of, uh, of travel decisions across species. So I'd like to thank uh, our research team in Ivory Coast, Max Planck Institute, and all my colleagues who helped, and you for listening. And I look forward to your questions, and I hope I did not go over time. <laughs> And now I'm going to hear myself. <laughs> Any questions? Thanks, Kalin. It was great. Uh, if there's, again, it was a great talk. If there's one quick question, we'll take it. Uh, uh, no, no question. Um, otherwise, we'll just move on and try to save time. I'm sure question will come up. I have a couple of questions. I saved them for the discussion. Okay, great. Thank you, Carla. So, 